Hello, Internet! Welcome to episode 219 of the Assorted Calibers podcast. The Second Minute podcast is a little bit for everyone. I'm Weird Beard, and t- with me tonight is my great hostess. If she was on the Br- Great British Baking Show, she would be noted as a wonderful tart, but with a soggy bottom. Erin Paulette! How are you doing, Erin? <laughs> Apologies to the fans of the Great British Bake Off. I even put you the title in that. I, I have never, I've, I've only tangentially watched that, but there is a number of people in my orbit that are in love with it, and we spent a lot of time talking about a soggy bottom, and I got thinking about that because, Aaron, you've been in a little bit of weather. <laughs> got, got a bit of rain, did you? <laughs> oh yeah. Uh had had a slight hurricane. Um as people <laughs> are probably aware by now, I, I didn't make it to GRPC because my flight was canceled ahead of the hurricane. Although the airlines were saying no, no. I mean, you know, we we were canceling it for Thursday, but we're definitely gonna have flights going out on Friday, and I'm going are you are you really? <laughs> and I didn't have confidence that the airport would be open. And then, of course, uh, the hurricane was then scheduled to turn north and hit South Carolina. And and where I live, most of my flights route through Charlotte, South Carolina. And so I could just see things going wrong so many different ways. You know, if I was even permitted to leave, then it might be okay, and GRPC is done, and I'm stuck in Dallas because, you know, Charlotte's been hit because, you know, God knows what Ian was going to do. You know, for all we knew, could have turned into a Cat 5 and, and, you know, destroyed South Carolina. And it's like, I, you know, I just, I don't feel comfortable leaving my mother who's in her 80s alone to weather you know, they were saying all sorts of scary things about Ian, about how, you know, it, it's one of the, the, the largest hurricanes to ever hit Florida. And it was just, you know what, I I I had to cancel and I apologized. And, you know, God bless the people at GRPC. They said, no, no, it, it's completely fine. They didn't let us down. You've got to be with family. We understand. And uh, I, I made the right decision, although I felt kind of guilty about it. But... Yeah, so I'm sure everyone started talking about Ian, and uh, I'm going to talk about it some more. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, b- because most of you who are listening aren't Floridians, and I want to give you just a little bit of perspective. Uh, I have not lived through a devastating hurricane, because when things look bad, I bug out, <laughs> because that's part of my prepper philosophy. The best way to survive... A dangerous encounter or an emergency is just not to be there when it happens. Um, but I really, truly felt that given Ian's position and it was going diagonally across Florida, and there were like 200 miles of land and and big built up city and forest between us and Ian, it's like, you know, I, we're, I think we're going to be OK. Um, but but so, so let me let me give you a perspective that I think most of you don't have. Um, so as you may know, hurricanes are divided into five categories. And so category five is the most destructive. It is the one that wipes towns off of maps. And the, the most famous one in my mind is Hurricane Andrew in the, uh, early nineties that just ate Homestead. And they then get progressively weaker into uh, down to category one. And honestly, most Floridians, because our houses and our infrastructure are designed to withstand hurricanes, we really don't pay much attention to a hurricane until it gets to category three. And then we're annoyed that we have to care. But one or two is just sort of a meh, you know, it, it it's an annoyance, uh, but we can get through it. And then... Below category one is a tropical storm. And so Ian was supposed to be a tropical storm when it got to us. And to that, I say no. Um, So when it hit Punta Gorda, it was classified as a category four. And category four, 
the win categories have seemingly arbitrary definitions here. I'm not really sure why. Um, and a category four has winds between 130 to 156 miles per hour. <laughs> that's that's 25. That yeah, I'm I'm not really sure how they arrived at this number. I wonder if the original um, calculations in, in in nautical miles. Perhaps I don't know. Um, okay, let me back up just a little bit and explain to you in practical terms what these mean. Um, category one hurricane. Uh, branches of trees are going to get knocked off and you're going to lose some shingles from your roof. And if trees fall the wrong way or if you get some lightning strikes, you'll lose some power. It's not a big deal unless you either don't have shelter or you're living in a place that isn't prepared for hurricanes, which is why Hurricane Sandy, which was the Category 1, kicked the crap out of New York City because they weren't prepared for a hurricane. All right, so category two is, okay, so now things are, the, the winds are more or less stripping trees bare, and you're going to lose, you know, most of the tiles on your, your roof will be compromised, most likely. Category three, what roof? <laughs> you, you, you are lucky that you have a house, really. Um, category four is um, trees are gone. And houses are beginning to disintegrate. And category five is what house? So when Ian hit, it was clocked at having wind speeds up to 155 miles per hour. That's two miles per hour less than hitting a category five. And honestly, based upon the photographs I've seen, and, and I've, I saw what Andrew did, it was... It may not have been mathematically a Category 5, but it was effectively a Category 5 because I'm looking at aerial photographs of coastal towns and it's just like when when you just basically see foundations and, you know, wreckage of timbers and it's like, okay, I could tell there used to be a house there, but it's not anymore and it goes on for blocks and blocks. The, that's a Category 5. <sighs> and so uh, this some bitch. I mean, it got to about Central Florida before it downgraded to a Category 3. And so when it hit, when it got to us, it was classified as a tropical storm. Again, I, I say BS. That was a light Category 1 hurricane because I've lived through tropical storms since the 1990s. And this was more than a tropical storm. This knocked down branches. This knocked out power across counties tropical storms don't do that hurricanes do that so, so you know I, I ian was a hurricane on steroids was definitely an overachiever and so i i'm very glad i made the decision to stay because i would have been worried about my mom the entire time um but we are fine our Entire neighborhood is fine. I can't really say our entire city, um, because I don't know for sure. I do know. So I live in a county that has multiple townships, and the Beachside community really got hit hard because Ian came in and it lashed them from the south because it came in below them, and then it got out to sea and turned north, and then it lashed them again from the well it was to the east of them so lashed them to the west and so they got it twice and they got storm surge and so they are messed up but you know i'm inland and and my community is fine just we we lost power for about 30 hours it could have been so much worse both in terms of destruction and just in terms of discomfort um because first of all it, it happened in late september as opposed to june or july where we would have just been dying um from the heat and the humidity but but like thursday it was still overcast and windy and so that actually kept things pretty comfortable for me i mean i wasn't like having a blast but you know it was like no I i'm only moderately sweaty and uncomfortable as opposed to i'm dying here and uh so that really really helped and uh we 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 lost a little bit of food 
in the fridge, but this was like all super perishables, like, you know, fruit and vegetables that goes bad if you look at it funny. But I don't think we lost anything in the freezer. And so um, all of my preps, well, actually, I shouldn't say all of them because I didn't use all of them. But but I, I had my preps handy, and it was a really good test. And I was able to make my mom's life a lot more convenient. It's like, yes, here, I've got plenty of lights and headlamps, and I've got solar chargers for batteries. And, okay, we, we want to heat up our food. Well, no, don't fire up the grill because that takes a lot of time, and it's a lot of smoke, and it's really hot. Here, let's use this camp stove that I have that works on wood pellets and, you know, can also charge my cell phone. Yeah, that's super convenient. And so I, I'm not going to say that it was a fun experience because it, it was really startling to me just how much I depended upon external stimuli. And so without power... You know, no no internet, no TV, and it was a little too dark to read. I was just sort of a, okay, I'm, I'm just here now. And so that was awkward, but it wasn't really bad. But I would have been worried if, if I hadn't been there with my mom, and my mom said I made her feel a lot better, and I was really helpful. So it was a good learning experience for me. So I, I regret that I couldn't be at GRPC, but otherwise, it it was, it, it seems really weird to say, yeah, I survived a hurricane and it was really productive, but, but it was. It was a good test of, of my gear and my, my mental preparation, but it wasn't just, you know, it kicked my butt either. So I, I've rambled for a while now and I'm very sorry, but it's, you know, it was something that I lived through and it was, um... Exciting is not the right word. Okay, so I thought I handled everything very well, and, you know, I, I didn't feel, like, super stressed. But when the power came back Friday afternoon, it was just, oh, thank God. And it just all the adrenaline and all the anxiety just crashed. And, and you know, my, my bones melted and my muscles were spaghetti, and I just... Uh, was very, very chill, and I don't want to do anything. <laughs> and that was most of the weekend. So it, it's just kind of interesting that I wasn't aware of how on edge I was until that particular source of anxiety was gone. So, yeah, that that was my weekend, and it was it was dramatic. We'll go with that. How is your weekend weird? Well, different dramatic. First up, I got to say that yet yeah, no 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 harm in your rambling about this because I've got to say anybody who is a longtime fan of ACP, I guarantee was thinking about you the same way all of us here in the ACP staff were thinking about you on the oh my goodness, I hope you're going to be okay. And on a, a similar note, uh, Ian, Ian also touched us because uh, this weekend was the uh, was the day that my wife chose and found was the best fit date for everyone to get together uh, for the remembrance ceremony. It wasn't a true funeral uh, per my per my father in law's wishes for my father in law, and so we just had a, a small graveside service uh, for him, but. Of course, my his his widow, who lives who lived with him in uh, in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, was right in the path of the hurricane, and mm -hmm. and her flight got canceled as well because she was supposed to fly out on Thursday, and it just wasn't going to happen. And I will say right now, white out in the open, I you know my wife realized this, and she was beside herself she was really really crushed because she realized oh my god i have worked so hard to get this and i really need the closure of having all of these wishes that i'm trying to fulfill because she she took she took it by that bull by the horns when my father-in-law passed uh she turned she turned around and said you know and said look i'll i'll handle all of this don't worry about it. I'm point for all of this and of which everybody in the family was grateful for. But that's that's a lot of work. And and so she suddenly realized like she was just getting to that point where she was really starting to to break down emotionally. Uh, and uh, 
<laughs> about with just all the stress of putting this all together. And so she saw the finish line in sight. And just before we got to the finish line, suddenly Ian popped up and went, nope, you're going to have to reschedule this. And we don't know how or when, because it's, he, he, the, he, is be, he, he is buried in northern Vermont, which in a few months is going to be a frozen wasteland. And so... And so, yeah, so she was very, very nervous about this. And we had a little bit of anger towards, uh, t- toward, towards my father-in-law's wife and, uh, for planning for, you know, for planning this so with such narrow window. Uh, and, uh, and so we, uh, and, and then suddenly she, we got a hold of her and she said, I, I need this to be over too. Just, you know, make whatever arrangements you can. That, that are best for me there and uh and we will uh and and I'll, I'll just you know i i will send my daughter who lives up in maine i will send her a you know prepared statement to read for me for you know for for my what i would what i would have said if i was there in person and just it was one of those wow that's that's a big move and uh it turned out there was enough uh cell phone reception in the in in the area that actually we uh there was a phone tucked off in the corner that uh she, she was on uh, apple facetime and 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 watching the whole uh the whole service in uh, in real time and it was being recorded so so she can now watch the 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 uh the much better quality recording of the service but Either way, it it went off beautiful. I think it's exactly what my father-in-law would have wanted. Uh, there were just so many people sharing their memories of his life, and uh, it just it went off well. And now my wife can breathe that sigh of relief, and 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 realize that we she is she is done with that. So yeah, that's uh, that was my week. It was uh, it was a, a different level. Oh, by the way, yeah, my my uh, my uh, father father in law's widow is is was just fine. I mean, she is in Fort Myers, which I think got nailed pretty hard from all accounts that I that that I, that I've read. But I guess it turned out that their their uh, their community didn't get hit terribly hard so she just lost power for a while but there's no i mean no 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 damage to the house that's worth worth note so that's that's really good news as well so so again i'm glad i'm glad that everybody that's in my orbit did uh did did well uh in uh in this and uh and I, uh, I, I, my heart goes out to the people who didn't because I, I, I don't want to be glib and say, oh, the, the handful of people that I know in Florida are all fine. So therefore, this was no big deal because this absolutely was not. Well, see, the thing about hurricanes is that they are very chaotic. And so you can very easily have a building that is completely destroyed by the storm and then literally next door the house receives minor damage. And I can't explain it. it. It probably takes people way smarter than me with a knowledge of chaos theory to be able to explain it if they can. But, I mean, I'm I'm looking at pictures of Fort Myers and there are parts of it that were just absolutely trashed. So I'm just going to go with your stepmother, I guess? Yeah. Yeah, your your stepmother was just very fortunate in that she... Uh, got through the hurricane unscathed because a lot of that town didn't. And just FYI, we 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 were talking about this. I think I think not never not on the show with with David because he was he had a similar situation after his father's passing because his father had uh, had had been had been remarried. But uh, just like this, the uh, the the woman that my father in law was married to never really had like a mother role to my wife, and so stepmother doesn't quite fit though it still uh, does so yeah goes goes mm-hmm. goes by yeah father father-in-law is foot wife father-in-law's wi- widow mm-hmm. but i have to give her um accolades for taking one for the team mm-hmm. and and because it would have been within her rights to oh, say 100%. no i'm i'm his wife 
I deserve to be there for the funeral and then delaying it. Mm -hmm. And and like you alluded to, pretty soon, um, way up north, what I think you said Vermont, I'm yeah, not sure. Yep. Um, yeah, the, the ground's going to freeze. And it's going to be really hard to bury someone. So who knows how long that could have been delayed. But but she took one for the team and just said, you know, let's let's get closure. Let's get him in the ground. And closure is so important for moving on. So kudos to her. Yeah. No, that that's exactly why we were so stressed out, because we knew it was 110 percent her call. If she said, no, I, I, I don't want it to go forward without us, without her. Uh, that's exactly what we would do. And I think our plan would have simply been to cancel the cancel the service on that day but still tell the funeral home still get him in the ground while it's while it's still soft and then we will still have the great graveside service just not with the urn present or hmm. at least not with it visible hmm. so just fyi weird i uh, i linked to you a new york times and it's got some really dramatic photographs including some before and after and you can see what i mean where it's just a case of, okay, you know, what homes, what neighborhood? Mm -hmm. And then you can also see, and, and there are some homes that are just standing and it's not really clear why. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, just, that's, that is crazy. I mean, cause you know, it makes sense with tornadoes because a tornado, it's a funnel cloud and it's one of those, mm -hmm. any, anyone who's ever been like in a whirlwind or a dust devil knows that <laughs> you see this little swirling piece of air and you're not experiencing any bit of it until it gets close to you and then you're feeling it and uh, just multiply that by 10,000 and, and, and you have a tornado. And so, and it digs little roads in things uh, as, as, as it goes. And so you could say that, yeah, if you get hit by it, yes, it's like, it's like a truck. If you get hit by it, it does a lot of damage, but if it misses you, yeah, it may do something, but, it, but it's not going to be like getting hit by it. But yeah, hurricanes are, are definitely not tornadoes. They spawn tornadoes. That's always fun. Yeah. Yeah. Babies. <laughs> really, the best thing you can say about that, not that there's anything great about it, is that the tornadoes they spawn aren't the really big ones. Um, oh, yeah. They don't call them categories. They call them F whatever anyway the point being is that you know they aren't the big massive f5 tornadoes or whatever so so they're they're only they're only mildly to moderately lethal as opposed to the town busters you get out on the great plains though that actually makes a lot of sense it just in theory because if it's if it's tossing out tornadoes and microbursts that could absolutely cause this level of like targeted destruction because Certainly, uh, a, 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 a few years back, we got a, we got a microburst in, in our town and literally like our neighborhood got trashed and like the next neighborhood over was fine. And actually we were over on the edge of it and it was over a few, you know, a few more streets and, uh, was where there was the most damage and the most trees pulled up out of the ground and things like that. And so. That 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 could be the answer to this question, but I am not a meteorologist, and maybe we should talk about something other than weather. <laughs> yeah, it, it does make us seem old. Uh, okay, so hmm, so this first topic, it's I, I find myself very conflicted about it because uh, on the one hand, if it happened to me, well. It, my initial response is shut up don't tell anyone don't don't say anything just keep quiet on the other hand i would have that little thing nagging at me it's like well you know what i'm doing i mean am i committing a crime should i report this and then we see how the atf treated these people and it kind of reinforces my first point not of course that i'm encouraging anyone to break the law no 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 so what story but, is this aaron so, yes, what we are talking about, some of you have seen it, is that apparently there is a couple who, so they are flippers, although in this case they aren't house flippers, but they, they buy surplus lots, they don't know what's in them, and, and then they 
you know, sell them on eBay once they parcel them out for higher prices. And it's like you see in Storage Wars, basically. Uh, and so uh, these people in uh, Houston, Texas, they they bulk ordered 108 storage cases, which was being sold by a government surplus website. It's not clear to me whether they actually bought from the government or the website bought government surplus, probably that one. Um, and so when... When one of them opened the case, inside were 12 M16s, select fire. Um, not not machine guns in the technical sense, but machine guns in the legal sense. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, the <laughs> well, the, the people who bought them um, were very obviously not gun owners uh, because they said later, no, we don't want them. We never wanted this. And so unsure of what to do. They reported this to the authorities, and I suppose I can't blame them, although as a gun owner, I I judge them, although I, I shouldn't. And so, according to the news, within hours, ATF and FBI agents seized the open box with the 12 weapons. I mean, they're using very aggressive language here because... The, the people voluntarily called the police and voluntarily surrendered, but then they're saying things like seized the box, and then the ATF obtained a search warrant for the storage unit. You'd think that the couple would have allowed them to? I don't know. Or, or they would have uh, asked. I mean, if if you've got... A, <laughs> a, again, these people are ca call, calling it in, and the, hey, we don't want this, come get it. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. why... Why are they doing being so aggressive about searching? You would think, yeah, they could ask because, of course, you know, police officers do it all the time. May I come in? Mm -hmm. That is them saying, may I enter your home? Because I am not allowed to unless you say yes. And then mm -hmm. if you do say yes, you can come in. And I will advise you as polite as it may be. A good answer is no, because we never know what we the. I forgot what the book was on how many felonies it's it's estimated everybody commits a day uh, because of our ever, ever increasing legal uh, legal situation. And, you know, God forbid they see, hey, you've got, you know, the this packed too packed close to your gas stove or you have this stored in a certain way or, you know, who, who, who knows? So the book is titled Three Felonies a Day. But that was published in 2009. I'm sure the number has gone up. So those are rookie numbers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, it's, it's I, one if, of those. If I, I were in, if, if I were in their shoes, I really don't know what I would do because the greedy gunny in me is just like, shut up, shut up. I have these. No one needs to know. Keep it quiet. Keep it quiet. But then I would be worried that somehow they would there'd be an investigation they would track it down they would the atf and the fbi and who knows would show up on my doorstep and shoot my dogs and it's like why didn't you report this so i don't know i think it would be like you know edgar Allan Poe's the 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 telltale heart <laughs> and this would be the the telltale gun box and it would just haunt me well but, that's that's yeah. that's where i i landed i i the first up Go the on. These were M16s, not M4s. So these guns were old, and they've been lost for a long time. And so, therefore, I've got to imagine they were going to stay lost as as long as somebody wasn't going to say anything or do anything. As long as that box was still sealed, those guns were going to be lost forever. No one was looking for them. They had been written off long ago. And so... Mm -hmm. That part you're in the clear for. The downside is, okay, now you've got a box filled with M16s. What do you do with them? What I would like to do with them is take them to the range and shoot the bejesus out of them. <laughs> and the problem with that is that while you're at the range, goodness knows, Gun ranges are filled with cops because they're of uh, uh, not all cops are gunnies, but a certain number of them. That was one of the reasons they got into cop being a police officer, or at least that's just a thing that you think about: cops, badge, and a gun. And so, 
there's gonna there might be a cop at the range and i certainly know of people who were shooting nfa items at the range and a police officer kindly walked over and asked to see what was going on like you do at the range and when they realized that yes indeed that was an nfa item they said hey do you have the tax stamp for that may may, may i inspect that and so that's that would be my my big concern is that you know it's not like my concealed carry permit of which the only reason why I've the only times I've ever used this in a, in a professional sense is because I have to show, show, show people to buy guns and ammo in Massachusetts. Uh, other than that, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's worth precisely nothing because at no point in time has a police officer ever asked why I was carrying a firearm in public, despite the fact that I am always carrying a firearm in public and I frequently see police officers. Um, so, but I, but it's one of those. If you're sh- if you're shooting a full auto gun at a shooting range, they are uncommon enough that it will turn it'll, it will draw some attention to you. And if they are extremely illegal M16s, that is not the kind of attention that you want. So I I I would have done exactly what this this couple did. Though I actually on another podcast I heard someone say, "Well, why wouldn't you at least just have one really fun day at the range?" <laughs> but take take a case of take a case of five five six and turn and turn it into smoke and noise in the absolute shortest period of time ever <laughs> and then say yeah I, I need to call these in i, I opened this box and i found them one of them's really dirty <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why that is <laughs> but uh yeah it it, it was it's really, I really put this more as just a, a, a funny and fun story. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're a hundred percent correct. Like it sounds like the, the ATF were absolute dicks to these, this couple. <laughs> it's one of those, like they called you. Why would you, t- why would you treat them like that? Why wouldn't you say, would you mind us looking in all the other boxes? Sure. Are these all the boxes? Can you show us the shipping manifest so that we can ca- confirm how many boxes were shipped to you? Excellent. Okay. We know that they, you bought this many boxes. We're going to make sure we counted this many boxes and searched them. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, so, no search warrant. So, you know, with search warrants, I mean, I've seen people have had search warrants executed on them. They trash the place they flipped that whole storage place upside down and then said there it's not my problem uh so yeah it, this is foolish and again another point to point out is we always hear the anti-gunners and saying that police and the military the only people who who should have these quote-unquote weapon wep- i mean these are real actual weapons of war uh and yet they lost these guns and they, they lost them. I mean, these guns, I guarantee were written off. I don't think anybody will have speak up and, 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 and bring to light whether or not they're written off, but for these to be M 16s and not M fours, uh, and you know, unless when did the Marines stop, stop issuing the M 16? Do you know off the top of your head? They were the last, I was literally Googling that and I am not sure. Uh, I'm going to stall for just a moment longer. But either way, it's it's these are not the current issue uh, uh, military weapons. So and these are also surplus boxes. So I've got to imagine that this is this is a fair. This box is fairly old and these guns have just they just never unpacked the guns out of them. Some some private schmuckatelli. (laughs) <laughs> to, 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 to miss lost count at so, some somewhere in the boxes and said oh yeah these are all done and one of them was completely filled with rifles and away it went and okay so it looks like the m16 is actually still in use by the military uh the current version is the m16 a4 mm-hmm. although it does seem like um the 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 sig spear is going to replace that at some point i mean at least at least partially i've got i've got to imagine that just like i i i do probably think that there probably are still some 
M16s being used as training rifles or in National Guard posts mm-hmm. or in Navy lockers and things like that. Um, oh, oh, yeah. When it comes to the reserves and the National Guards, they be, they they get hand-me-downs the way that younger children get them from older siblings. It's like, yes, okay, so, so the older child, a.k.a. active duty branches, they get the shinies, and so their stuff then gets sent down to, um, you know, further rear echelon units. So, yeah, th- there might be some units out there that are still using, uh, they're probably not using Vietnam-era M16s anymore. But, uh, like, for example, when I was in ROTC in the 90s, and we went to qualify with rifles, I mean, I don't really know for certain how old it was, but it, it was a pretty old rifle, and it wouldn't have surprised me if it was like a 1970s Vietnam-era rifle. Well, the big question is, did you have the triangular handguards? Because that's at least, I mean, I'm, I'm hardly a, a, uh, an AR slash M16 expert. Okay, but- you're, you're, you're having me remember, you know, 30-some years back, but I want to say yes. Mm. So, so, so that was that was the older one before they before they before they shifted over to the round hand guards. So yeah, it was it probably was your, the probably guns you were handling probably were Vietnam vets. Mm-hmm. But yeah, either way, I I I think these guns were written off by the people who we absolutely should trust to have these guns, <laughs> and and they were sold off to surplus where they could be bought by anybody and. In theory, it could have been somebody who was definitely a lot more dodgy. You know, it could be someone who 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 knew a guy who knew a guy, and while he might not keep it for himself, people that are already convicted felons and drug dealers and gang hitters, it's it's no sweat off their back to uh, to take possession of some some felony uh, some felony uh, M16s because they got a whole bunch of heroin and crack and meth and stuff that's just as much a felony. <laughs> How's it saying go after the first felony, all the rest are free? That's correct. <laughs> so so yeah, for for them, who cares? It's just like the saying like the gun free school zone act. Yeah, it'll stop school shootings because yeah, if you're going in to murder a whole bunch of people, seeing a sign that says no guns allowed here is certainly going to slow you down. That sounds like a segue, weird. Uh, yes. I I don't know what it is though. So why don't you help me out, Eric? <laughs> Well, I mean, the, the next topic right here says every town begging TV writers to write more anti-gun TV plots. Yes. And so we, we go from um, gun-free zones to anti-gun propaganda. It, it It's the same sort of magical thinking here. Mm-hmm. And I just, I saw this and it just made me laugh because how much the mighty have fallen uh, because back in the day... Um, Back in the day, the it was specifically the Brady campaign was very big in either directly writing scripts. They actually had script writers on staff, or they had um, essentially style notes being handed out to various Hollywood screenwriters for this is what you need to do. And in the nineties, there was a number of pretty much all the primetime TV shows had at one point or another, a gun episode that all had a very, very similar story arc where the character had a a need somehow brought to their attention, a, a, a natural desire to own a gun they purchased a gun, and then by the end of the episode, they've learned to regret that decision and got rid of the gun. And essentially t- telling everybody that, yes, we understand you may want to own a gun at some point, but the smart thing to do is to get rid of it. Uh, and of course, the uh, <laughs> there was my favorite of the Lethal Weapon series, <laughs> Lethal Weapon 3, which was the cop killer bullet uh, one. And and, and uh, that is, uh, if you search on our, on our website, uh, that is free to... Uh, uh, to uh, t- to anybody, if you want to listen to an ACP film track, the ACP film track of uh, Lethal Weapon Three is available on the Assorted Calibers uh, podcast website. Uh, but now they've gone from being—I uh, mean, and this goes all the way up to Miss Sloan, which was an absolutely her- it was literally one of the worst movies ever made. Uh, the box office scores was like below Geely, and. Uh, and this movie, 
the Brady campaign was actually a, a protagonist. The the protagonists worked for the Brady campaign named, and it was the Brady campaign going up against the gun lobby. So it was very clearly we aren't just naming groups because we're not going to name the NRA as this shadowy pro gun organization uh, because they might sue us. But yet we're going to name the Brady campaign, which means that they at least signed off of it. And I suspect they had a lot more to do with that uh, terrible movie than that was said. And now they've gone from essentially writing scripts and helping write scripts for movies to just begging, please, will you write anti-gun scripts? <laughs> I have to wonder what Hollywood gets out of this. I mean, I think originally it just started off as just just feel good mm -hmm. where it was just oh we're a part of it we're helping and then of course also uh you know back then the brady campaign would throw these big hollywood galas where all these celebrities would get together and there was there there, there was booze and wine and speeches and uh it, you know it, it, or d'oeuvres and uh, you had all these great pictures. Like, I mean, obviously there was one very, very famous one from the nineties that was uh, Sylvester Stallone and Bernie Mac standing at a Brady campaign event with the Brady campaign banner, banner behind them. And of course people noted that, that, uh, that both of them were, were avid shooters and gun owners that were selling out the rest of us for, for the little spot in the limelight. Sylvester Stallone even had one of the rare Los Angeles concealed carry permits. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> this is this is one of those instances where it's it's fun to watch how far they're falling, especially since I, I still deeply suspect. Well, this I mean, this is every town. So this is Michael Bloomberg. Uh, and, I, and I and I think that they've they've wrapped in like the Brady campaign and Giffords and uh, and, and, and the other groups are all kind of all underneath every town, though, in some of them, not so as you'd notice or you could directly write down. But this is every town itself. This is Michael Bloomberg. This is Michael Bloomberg and Michael Bloomberg money and Michael Bloomberg organization that is doing this and so reduced to begging mm -hmm. exactly yeah it's, i mean it's not like michael bloomberg's run out of money he's still <laughs> i mean he just he can't i mean he's he's openly said when i mean he's formed these charitable groups and literally his open statement is i can't spend all of this money so therefore i am just creating as many charities and as many side projects as i can to just get rid of this money before I die. And of course he's a very old man. So that's not going to be very long from now, uh, proverbially speaking. And so the, are uh, relatively speaking. And so, yeah, the, the, the fact that he's just got all of this money yet, it seems that this exact moment, it's not prioritized. So it's, it's, it, so instead they're left to begging. <laughs> and so we'll we'll see how it plays out. I mean, I I know you were seeing some anti gun stuff in uh, was it the Arrow series? Was the last place you saw it? Or <laughs> well, yes, but I, I don't watch a whole lot of no. I, okay, I take that back. Um, that's the last one I talked about because that one was just so atrocious on many levels, and I feel like I've talked it to death. Um, the last one that I saw was actually the thing that got me to stop watching NCIS. And this was, I want to say, last year. And NCIS was already on shaky ground for me because a lot of the actors I liked had left. And they were doing a lot of emotional manipulation regarding COVID. And, you know, oh, a, a cast member, his wife died, and he was very sad and, and things like that. And then they did something involving ghost guns. And I don't remember the plot, mainly because they said the word ghost gun and they came up with some other inaccuracies. And I just said, you know what? I'm done watching. And I literally got up and walked away about 15 minutes into the show. Um, so that's that's the last time I saw it. But I don't watch a lot of TV. So there could have been one more recent than that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I remember actually watching back in the, the, the early, you know, Mark Harmon and, and, uh, 
and this I don't I, this might have even been when 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 Caitlin Todd was still was was still in there, uh, but uh, the uh, um, but yeah, but they had they had one where yeah the killer had bought a gun at a gun show and it was very very shady operation and there was a lot of snide statements about. Uh, the private gun owners and who they were and what they were. And so, yeah, the, it, that wasn't the only instance where NCIS was anti-gun, but it was, it was few and far between. Mm-hmm. So Aaron, this next story you put in. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I just, I didn't exact, didn't expect you to shift gears that quickly. <laughs> and, and now we have to go from being jocular to being somber. Yes. Um, All right, give me a minute. Right, so this next story comes to us courtesy of um, Emily Miller from Emily Gets Her Gun, a very rare pro-gun journalist living in Washington, D.C. And she reported that uh, Judge Lawrence Silberman died, well, for us yesterday. Uh, So that would be... Sunday, October the 2nd. And for people who don't know that name, and I'm not judging you because I'm terrible with names. Isn't that right, Willard? Uh, (laughs) Judge Lawrence Silberman uh, was for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. And he was instrumental in what led to the Heller decision because he was the one who in 2007, ruled that D.C.'s complete ban on gun ownership was unconstitutional. And then D.C. appealed the ruling to the Supreme Court, which led to the Heller decision. And that led to uh, McDonald versus Chicago and eventually led to Bruin. And so this gentleman played a pivotal role in the rights of uh, in, in, in the fights for for Second Amendment rights. Um, he, he had a very good life. He died at 86 years old. And so I'm not going to say that that's a good age to die, but he had a very good life. It's not like he died tragically, you know, in his prime. And, um, and so it, it's a sad day, but... He got to see the the fruits of his labor. Um, that is a terrible. What am I trying? I think that's I think I mean, that's a fair enough statement. Is that yeah? He 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 ruled this, and it, it got it it got appealed. But this was clearly part of his vision mm. of of the Second Amendment and 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 what it meant. And yeah. The the point that I'm I'm trying to make here is that he planted the seed that led to Bruin and he got to see Bruin um you know, to continue the metaphor, you know, the seed that he planted became a tree and it bore fruit. And so it you know, he, he got to see something that he did uh, you know, blossom into the fullness of what it could be. And I would hope that that was very rewarding to him. Yeah, and especially you know he. I don't. I don't know what uh, what condition he was when he passed, but if he was at all aware, you know, in the last few months, just seeing all the different cases that are being kicked up around the country, thanks to Bruin, because we certainly didn't see this amount of cascading after Heller or after McDonald. Uh, you know, we certainly saw a bunch of a bunch of states straightened up and flew right and changed a few of their policies but i just i didn't quite we did i I don't remember seeing this many cases showing up citing mcdonald or uh, or heller as there are cases citing bruin Mm -hmm. well i mean that's the thing about foundations they aren't sexy but they are absolutely essential and you can't have the the beautiful castles without a solid foundation and that's what this gentleman was yeah that that is great and uh our heart goes out to their to their family for his passing but uh but also i i i think you've got a fair statement is he lived a long life I've got to assume that he was surrounded by people who loved him and we are two complete strangers at saying he will absolutely be missed and he left his mark on this world. And that's the most any of us can help hope for in our lives. Absolutely. 
I mean, as as David likes to say, may his memory be a blessing, mm -hmm. and his memory is definitely a blessing to all of us in the Second Amendment community. Yep. And so, yep. <laughs> shifting gears from that, there's a lot of court stuff to talk about. I don't know how we don't have a ton to talk about with uh, each one, but uh, but uh, this first one is, is is a little bit of a sad story. Is the Supreme Court has uh, has declined to take a uh, a bump stock case. Well, uh, not just one. There were actually two. Yeah, there was a. Uh, a Potion versus Barr, and there was, oh, Gun Owners of America. Mm -hmm. Okay, it used to be versus Barr, and now it's versus Garland because of the new Attorney General, but I'm rambling now. Yep, but uh, yeah, they uh, we were just talking about this because you're asking, oh, is there a reason to give it? And I, and I don't think as a general rule they give reasons. Uh, it's just the uh, the does what what cases are they going to take from a, a certain docket and uh, and this was not one of them and this is absolutely disappointing and just as a a middle finger at this choice I uh, I posted the uh, the gun collectives they did a video where Adam Kraut uh, put a uh, Ran ran a mag of ammo through a uh, an AR fifteen affixed with a butt stock, and they filmed uh, they filmed the gun specifically focusing on the trigger and his trigger finger uh, while the gun was firing in simulated full auto. I guess is the best way to say it, and you can clearly see the trigger completely resetting his finger coming off the trigger and his finger going back on the trigger, which clearly shows that it is not a machine gun so yeah this is a lousy choice it it upsets me i don't like it because the bump stock ban is garbage these are not machine guns in any way mm. shape or form per the letter of the law and this is exactly what the supreme court is there to do is to look at the law and look at the precedent and realize nope not a machine gun how dare you say it was this is overruled but that's not going to happen. And I guarantee that there are people listening to me right now that have bump stocks squirreled away somewhere, because certainly when the ban went through, the, 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 everybody knew how many there were out there and, and, and they saw how many came back, which was very, very, very few. And some people may have destroyed them on their own accord, which is, which is fine. But, Let's be honest. You and I, we both know that, yeah, there's a whole bunch of bump stocks squirreled away in various locations and in people's, in people's homes and, and, and wherever they may have, may, may have hidden them in the event that this gets overturned, which I'm hoping will get done. But, uh, I, I just have to rewind to, and, and I forget what year it, it was, and I, I could look it up, but all that. But when the court, it was back when Trump was president, and the court decided that they weren't going to hear a Second Amendment case uh, at all. And that included the uh, the uh, Healy versus Warman uh, case, which was against the Massachusetts assault weapons ban and Mara Healy's little edict that essentially said, I'm not going to tell you what an assault weapon is, but I know it when I see it. And, and that was devastating for me because it's, it was a, just like this, a super duper bad ruling. I've talked enough about Mara Healy's little edict of the, I'm not passing a new law at all. I'm just saying that we've been interpreting it wrong all this time. And I'm clearly the greatest legal mind ever because no one ever saw what I saw that was in the law that was never written anywhere. And it just, it seemed like such a low hanging fruit. And then the Supreme court didn't take it. And that was really upsetting. But now we have a number of assault weapons ban cases that are coming through. So it's coming back around. So this is, this chapter is over on bump stocks, but it is not the end, end of the story on bump stocks. And hopefully they will go back around and, uh, and revisit this again. And hopefully the case will be ruled th the obvious way. Hmm. I, I am curious what judge thomas's reaction to this because you know he definitely wanted to hear this case mm -hmm. 
And um, I'm guessing Roberts didn't. And I'm just wondering, I, I'll probably never know. I'm just wondering what, what the split was. Yeah. So. Eh. Who knows? Yeah, and, and we will never know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We've got uh, two other court cases here that are a whole lot better. Now, this this next one is in your backyard, Weird. So you tell us what's happening regarding the Supreme Court telling Massachusetts to do. Uh, yeah, they are identifying a, uh, a, a where Massachusetts has, we've got our, we have no Second Amendment rights in Massachusetts. We have to have a license to own, uh, to own a firearm and these licenses are were may issue still kind of are may issue we're we're waiting to see how this is all going to develop out but essentially there are a handful of misdemeanors that will preclude you from getting yourself a license to carry in the state of Massachusetts and the supreme court has identified that that this is one of the cases that will be heard and which case is that weird? Uh, it is Morin versus Liver. I actually had now that sounds very familiar. I believe we talked about this on the podcast before. Did we? Because I, <laughs> I, 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 I draw, I'm drawing a blank on it. Yeah, we did because Morin is a doctor who has a concealed carry permit, and he foolishly uh, took his gun with him and was carrying it with him when he visited Washington, D.C. And he was in one of these museums that had an advertised no weapons policy. And so the gentleman meant well, but did a very foolish thing by going to, I don't know if it was museum security or if there was an actual armed police officer, and basically said, I, I see that you have a no guns policy. I would like to check my firearm. <laughs> and he was arrested and tried, and I don't know if he pled or was convicted. Uh, he was convicted on a gun-related misdemeanor, and they they didn't take away his firearms, but he's not permitted to buy any more new ones. Mm -hmm. You don't remember discussing this? I, I, I do. I, yeah, I, I, do, I do remember the case now. It's just the <laughs> I'm equally horrible with names here, so the, the name the name was a complete blank to me. But I do rem I do remember this story. So yes, and I mean I think that especially given the nature of 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 the restriction, it makes no damn sense. So and the the law is written out is that yes we have we still agree that felons, uh you know under the gun control act you know, can't possess firearms. And uh, I have, I have pr some problems with that. Um, I certainly could be persuaded that violent felons, specifically people who, who have shown to have poor impulse control as far as harming other individuals, maybe ha give, giving them force multipliers is not the greatest idea. Uh, but when it comes to people like Martha Stewart, my f most famous example of famous nonviolent felon. <laughs> Am I at all concerned that if Martha Stewart owns a gun? No, not in the least. She's, she's as far as I know, she's never done anything violent in her life. And, and, and today or tomorrow is not going to be the first time. And so the idea that Martha Stewart might have a 38 in her handbag is nothing that's going to bother me. Um, but that's a, that's a horse of a different color because we're not talking about felonies here. We're talking about misdemeanors. All right. Now the last one is this, this one is, uh, another really, really good one. And that is the federal court has tossed the Mexico suit against U.S. gun makers. And I, and do you, do you remember talking about this one, Aaron? I believe so. Yeah. The Mexican government was suing, uh, Smith & Wesson, Ruger and Glock. And others. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and others, but those are the big ones in, in, in U.S. court because of guns getting trafficked into Mexico by criminals. And this gun is, runner, <laughs> fast and furious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. 
Uh, though I think these are specifically not Fast and Furious guns being cited because that would be a little on the nose. Um, but I mean, this is we 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 pointed out this was a a dumb case to begin with, and uh, and like I say, the court did the right thing by dumping the case, and so it's all gone, and uh, um, and uh, there 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 will be no more. There's not much more to say say about this. It's it, it it was the actions of criminals, not the actions of the gun companies. I I know the anti-gunners are constantly trying to vilify gun companies and saying that for some strange reason they are, they are they 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 are complicit in the the action of criminals and straw purchasers and people who are getting their guns stolen. Uh, but it's just not the case. And so the idea that Mexico could think that they had any right to sue us over guns that were trafficked by criminals is pure foolishness. Well, I get the feeling that Mexico was egged on by certain other elements, Bloomberg, um, because the entire point of this, I feel, is that this was a way to undermine the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act, which, you know, when this case was dismissed, the U.S. District Judge specifically said, no, um, PLACA specifically shields the companies. You can't sue them. And so I don't know if this was a long shot. It kind of feels like a Hail Mary to me. Um, but as the saying goes, we have to win every time. They only have to win once. Mm-hmm. And so this this was an attempt and it fell through. But they they had to take the shot. And I guess that they were hoping that they would get a more sympathetic judge or I, I don't know. I don't have particular insight into the the strategy of gun grabbers. But, yeah, they, they tried to take a shot and it failed. They, they will take others. And that's a great point because, yeah, creativity is definitely something that we're seeing a lot of with the anti-gunners because you, you you mentioned under your breath just a little bit ago fa- operation fast and furious and it is my personal belief that the whole point of operation fast and furious clearly a lot of people made reference to at the time to defend the obama administration and and and, uh, and their involvement in this of the uh, george w bush program called operation wide receiver where it was rifles with GPS trackers in the stocks that were being salted into cartel. Um, I, I, I don't, I know exactly how they were getting a hold of them, but there was like, it was like, I think under a hundred guns and they, and they had trackers in them and the trackers didn't work. And as soon as that happened, they just immediately stopped the program. Uh, in this case, it was literally cases upon cases upon cases of rifles just be just be given to the cartels in, in, by means of the cartels being given money. And then the ATF telling gun companies to not deny the sales, even though these were illegal sales. And when the Nix check was going through, the Nix check was actually being sabotaged by the ATF so that these people would get their guns. And in some cases, uh, gun shops were actually being threatened that their license would be revoked if they didn't let these guns go into the hands of the cartels. And there was no tracking. There was no nothing. These were just regular off-the-shelf semi-auto rifles. And they went into Mexico and they killed a whole bunch of people there. And they came back across the borders and killed a few Americans here. And I believe the whole purpose of all of this was an end run around um uh Heller and McDonald in the fact that they were going to try to frame passing gun bans as a means of of national security and being good neighbors to our countries. Yes, I understand you have a right to keep a pair of these guns, but what about the poor Mexicans and Canadians? So I I certainly see your 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 idea of this being a, a way of trying to get the the type of lawsuits that were being done by the anti-gunners to bankrupt the gun industry. We don't have to win. We just have to keep suing them and they'll eventually die. And 
but doing this with foreign entities instead of domestic entities as a way to possibly sidestep Placa. Either way, we're glad it did work. <laughs> Pivoting from federal to state level, David is here once again to talk about the New York training laws. And here's a very preemptive fudge, New York. Hi, and welcome to Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. After my previous segment on the updated New York pistol permit training requirements, I hoped that that was the end of it for a while, and I could think of other, more pleasant things, like root canals and colonoscopies. However, I've received more information regarding the new training requirements from a contact in New York who would, for obvious reasons, prefer to remain anonymous. One of the first things they mentioned is that New York State does not get a cut of the instructor fee for the 16 hours of classroom and 2 hours of range time. The fees they've seen throughout their section of the state range from $275 through $550. The $799 fee I talked about in a previous episode was for downstate. Due to the law of supply and demand, there's always a things are more expensive here additional cost to anything in those areas. The trainers in my contacts region got together with their local licensing officer to try and get everyone on the same page as best they could. It's phrased that way because apparently New York State isn't answering any questions or giving any guidance on this legislation. Not terribly surprising, as the state still hasn't answered questions about the Unsafe Act, which was passed over nine years ago back in 2013. One of the big concerns the instructors expressed is costs including the cost of their time, cost of materials, and of other resources. After some discussion, they agreed on around $600 for the classes held in their area. People being people, a few of the local instructors broke ranks and decided to charge a slightly lower fee. The trainers are also expected to come up with a lesson plan based on the somewhat vague outline I discussed in my previous segment on this topic. One point on the pro side is the classes can be of any size. One instructor and 20 or 30 students is doable for the classroom portion. On the con side is the range portion. The vast majority of these students will have never even touched a handgun. That limitation, by the way, is a long-standing part of New York State law. It is illegal there for an adult over the age of 21 to even touch a handgun without a pistol permit. They certainly won't have internalized the four rules of gun safety merely from the classroom portion. Based on this, the instructors agreed a one instructor to three student ratio is the maximum for safety. This means instructors will have to have assistant instructors, who will also have to be paid for their time. In addition, there's the question of what handguns will the students be using for the range portion. Not their own, obviously, as they can't buy one without a pistol license, which this class is the initial step to apply for one. Ammo will likely not be included in the price of the class. Thankfully, it's only five rounds per student, but that's still an added expense. Wear on tear on the qualification firearms, eye and ear protection, and range access are additional costs to the instructors as well. Yet another concern expressed was liability for damage or injury that occurs during a class. New York State's position is, That's not our problem. If you want to teach these classes, that's your new additional cost and risk of doing business, puppy kickers. Finally, even though this is a state license and state-mandated training requirement, students apparently cannot take the class in a county other than the one that will eventually be issuing their permit, because reasons. Part of the rationalization for this is judges in different counties may be approving different course curricula, so there won't necessarily be sufficient training consistency from county to county. If the county has a pro-Second Amendment judge, the curriculum will probably be closer to the instructor's ideal. If the county has an anti-Second Amendment judge, there may be extended delays and challenges getting the course content approved. This confusion will probably continue until NYSERPA v. Bruin 2 gets to the Supreme Court and everything changes again. In the meantime, there are a lot of good people up there trying to do the best they can with what they've been handed. As my New York contact said, it's new territory for everyone. The truth is we already have penalties for illegal use of weapons, do we not? Yes. And, and criminals, being what they are, don't seem to care too much about any penalty. That's why they are, by definition, criminals. So I'm just wondering why we think that this is, after 600 failed gun laws apparently in this state, why this is the magic elixir 
that is suddenly going to get criminals to pay attention to a law. That about wraps up this segment. If you have any questions for me or suggestions for future segments or a comment on a past segment, please post them on the Assorted Calibers podcast, Facebook, or MeWe pages, and Aaron or Weird will make sure I see them. I'm also a contributor on the Blue Collar Prepping blog, which can be found at bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com. We're always looking for people interested in submitting posts to the blog, so please check out the site. Finally, I'm also a published author, and books with my stories can be found on Amazon under the name Brenna Bock. That's B-R-E-N-A-B-O-C-K. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. I'm David, and this is Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. Five rounds per student? I mean, you're just getting the gun dirty. <laughs> but that being said, I I did only have to fire one round for my Florida live fire requirement, uh, which I guess actually makes actually more sense than five rounds because if you want to make sure that you're not going to shoot yourself in the foot and you know which side the which side the bullets come out of one round is all you need and really but if you're shooting more than one round like what are you going to accomplish with five rounds that you didn't with one i th- this is news to me because i also took the florida concealed carry test and i had to shoot more than f- one round I uh, I believe we were given a full magazine of a Ruger Mark III. So, I don't know why you only had to shoot one. Maybe it was because you already had a Massachusetts concealed carry. I think I, don't know. I think because the uh the class that I took the class that I took was literally the barest of minimum. Let's just say the instructor, which I also put in fear quotes <laughs> of the class Oh, is that why you said it that way? The class. <laughs> the, okay. The uh, the instructor had a uh, a drop leg holster on, and in that whole, whole drop leg holster was a Taurus twenty four seven. Oh no! Oh oh oh! It gets better. Oh, it was and it was a <laughs> nylon full nylon <laughs> nylon one size fits most sausage sack, sausage sack. drop leg holster. <laughs> With a cheap Taurus pistol stuck into it and a concealed carry badge pinned to the nylon sausage oh, no. sack holster. Oh. oh no. So I I'm I'm pretty sure that that the, the the lawyer that 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 worked that worked for that particular gun shop went over and said yes this class meets the minimum minimum uh, uh requirements for the florida concealed carry course and <laughs> does not exceed them in any way shape or form of which again i was totally fine because i was a a, a veteran concealed carrier at that at, at that point in time and i was just getting the permit for a mere formality yeah, when I heard you say this meets the minimum standards, I'm basically hearing that Futurama quote about you are technically correct. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I, I don't know. Again, yeah, it's it's far better to have shot more rounds than none. You know, if you're gonna if if you're gonna be having a, even if it's a mandatory training, you know, you might as well put a little bit more effort into it. But eh. Either way, we have we have constitutional carry in most of the country, and that doesn't seem to be a problem. So I'm not losing any sleep about quote unquote shoddy training, but I will lose some sleep over excessive crap like this because this is just going to be preventing people from from getting permits and and, and pricing pricing out people from getting from getting permits, which let's be honest is the whole point. Mm hmm. And I just wanted to close with David uh, sent me a message about the uh, the the little uh, sound clip that was in the middle. He says he, he, I might not recognize the the person in that clip, and I did not. Uh, but that is Assembly Member Steve McLaughlin uh, uh, debating the, as he said, unsafe act in 2013. And uh, Steve was uh, was David's representative when he uh, when he when he lived in the state of New York. So for our final segment of the Assorted Calibers podcast, I am going to start a fisk that is a part of a larger project, and I hope you will all enjoy it. (laughs) 
So this is the start of a series of fisks I'm going to do, which also ties in well with a frequent request I get from listeners of the show. I'm going to be fisking an episode of the Red, Blue, and Brady podcast, where they attempt to fisk the talking points of Second Amendment supporters. After these mass shootings that gain national attention, a lot of questions come up in conversation. Some of those questions, though, posit that gun violence prevention methods aren't the answer. That gun violence is the product of things like poor mental health or video games or just plain evil. How do we, as folks who care about gun violence prevention, how do we best answer those questions? So in this very special episode, we're bringing you 12 very common questions that are raised after a mass shooting and the answers that we, 12 different staffers at Brady, give in response. So two birds with one stone. I can fisk some anti-gun media and address some common talking points of the anti-gunners with my personal rebuttals and show notes. Let's dive right in. Statement number one, we have a mental health problem, not a gun problem. I can't 100% disagree with this, but I will note that we certainly have a much bigger mental health problem than we do a gun problem. I would argue that our gun problem is really a gang problem, And the gang problem is really the issue with there being a high demand for drugs and prostitution, but very few legal avenues. But that's going way past the topic. My name is Colleen Creighton. I'm director of End Family Fire for Brady. So this is a side venture of the Brady campaign that promotes safe storage and suicide prevention without ever listing a vetted locking device for purchase or listing a suicide hotline. I'll let you know, you can simply go to your local police station and ask for a gun lock, and they will give you as many as you want, courtesy of the National Shooting Sports Foundation. And if you're feeling like you might want to end your life, call Samaritan Suicide Hotline. Looks like you can simply dial 988 from any phone or click the link in the show notes. Also, there are local numbers for groups near you. So now that I took some time doing the work that they should be doing, let's get on to her rebuttal. I think we do have a mental health problem in the United States. We do not have adequate funding or access to mental health here throughout the country. This is 100% correct. It's all too difficult for people who are in mental health crisis to get the help they need. And sadly, this isn't even an issue we can throw money at, as I know people who have resources and insurance, and they've been having issues getting the help they need too. But I do think what we're seeing now is we have an access to lethal means problem. And so far too many people have access to lethal means, and this is the problem where it all comes down to. But do we? America is one of the safest countries in the world. Now, the anti-gun groups like to handpick from the safest countries in the world and note that in that group of safest countries in the world, United States is the unsafest, safest country in the world. Never mind that countries like Mexico, Brazil, Honduras, South Africa, Russia, Ukraine, among many others, have a vastly higher violent crime and even more gun crime than the United States, even though they have massively oppressive gun laws and much less access to lethal means. So maybe gun control isn't the solution you're looking for. And statistically across the board, those with mental health issues are more likely to be victims uh, than the perpetrators of a lot of crimes. This is totally true. And further, mental health evaluations are a poor predictor of spree killers. So the mental health problem we have in this country is almost totally unrelated to the violent crime problem we have. Still, It's telling that anti-gun groups keep mentioning this, but are still totally fine with the involuntary commitment part of the Gun Control Act being used to strip people of their rights. No matter what they say, there is no gun law they aren't totally in love with. If you look across the board, if you look at the number of incidents across the country, the majority of deaths by suicide are by firearm. So I think the latest statistics showed that 53% of all suicides are by firearm. Yes. More than half of all the gun deaths are suicide, and more than half the suicides in America are with firearms. This implies that if we get rid of guns, we can get rid of suicide. And may I add that you don't need a semi-auto rifle with a 30-round magazine to end your life. In fact, you could do yourself in with a single-shot rifle or shotgun. So we really would need to ban all guns for this to potentially eliminate half of suicide. And that assumes that without the gun, there would be no suicide. 
Yes, guns are a preference to Americans, but nearly half of all suicides do it without the benefit of a gun. To make an analogy, if you walked into a restaurant with plans to have a hamburger and they told you that they were out of beef, but you could order anything else on the menu, are you saying you'd leave hungry? I think the solution is instead to enter the restaurant already full, as in not wanting to harm yourself. Again, call Samaritans if you feel the need. So a lot of times providing that that just length of time and access to lethal means when in a time of crisis can save somebody's life. There are certainly studies that show this, but there are a lot of countries with similar or greater suicide rates, and all of them have much more limited access to firearms. I just don't think we can ban our way out of this problem. But I also think there's unintentional. So we, across the country, we lose eight children a day to unintentional injury. And that means a kid gets into a firearm within their house, you know, or while playing with a neighbor or grandparents, and then they don't know it's not a toy. They're playing with it. And unfortunately, it takes their life. Whoa, eight children a day. That adds up to almost 3000 deaths a year. I have in the show notes a study that looked at the unintentional firearms death in the United States for the decade of 2005 to 2015. And in that decade there were only 1,260 total for all ages. She's claiming there's almost twice the number of children who are killed accidentally by a firearm in a year than there are actually in an entire decade for all ages. To turn this liar, liar pants on fire into a full-on conflagration, gun deaths have been dropping like a rock as far back as I have seen data. Accidental deaths used to be so much more common back when our parents and grandparents were kids. Why? Well, one reason is hunting isn't as common as it was. It's gone from a full-on way of living to feeding the family to almost exclusively a recreation. And the times when you can actually be out in the woods or fields with a rifle or shotgun to put some meat in the pot has shrunk considerably over the last century. So the less people traipsing around in the woods and without the blaze orange hunting attire that only first started in the 1960s, the less people accidentally catching a bullet meant for a duck or a deer. Plus, we have a gun culture that is much more devoted to safety. When I was a kid, the only people who had gun safes were people that had massive collections. It wasn't uncommon to see an unsecured gun just leaning up against a wall or on a rack or in a closet. And Ian Fleming wrote about James Bond sleeping with a loaded Walter PPK under his pillow without a hint of irony. Of course, we could always do more to reduce accidental gun death, as every death is a tragedy. But banning our way out of this simply won't work, as the outlaws, who will then be the only gun owners, won't be as concerned about properly securing their illegal pieces as you are. Instead, we need to teach basic gun safety in public schools. Elementary students should know the Eddie Eagle rules of stop, don't touch, leave the area, and find an adult. Middle school students should know the basic parts of a firearm as well as the different operating systems of common guns, as well as Jeff Cooper's four rules of gun safety. The gun is always loaded. Never let the muzzle cover anything you aren't prepared to destroy. Keep your finger off the trigger guard until you're ready to shoot. And always be sure of your target and what lies beyond it. Note, these two grades can be 100% taught without a single live firearm being in the classroom. And finally, all students before they graduate high school should be able to demonstrate basic proficiency in rifle, pistol, and shotgun. This last one makes good sense, but honestly, the first two would do the lion's share at preventing gun accidents. The key to gun safety is respect for firearms. That was one scary lesson I learned early in my life of shooting. I learned you need to watch a new student closely, as safety rules are a lot to take in in the first few trips to a hot range. But anti-gun new shooters are the worst. I assume their anti-gun attitude was rooted in fear, and that would make them more hesitant than a new shooter who is enthusiastic about guns. But it seems the few openly anti-gun new shooters that I've taught have been more dismissive of guns, leading to surprising and dangerous behavior on the range. I helped remedy this with education, but wouldn't it be better if everybody got the same education from an early age? Of course, anti-gun groups don't care about gun safety. They only care about banning guns, so they'd never agree with real common sense safety policies. But that shouldn't surprise you. And her last point was a blatant and bald-faced lie. And I have the podcast linked in the show notes so you can hear the complete show and inspect their webpage 
to note that there are no references to support her outlandish claims. But all my sources are in the show notes for you to read. Those are your Antigon talking points and a few rebuttals to combat them. So weird. How many times have I verbally rolled my eyes or made an exasperated sigh or otherwise done a God weird. Why do you make me listen to these audio fisks? I hate them. Uh, I think a, a lot, right? I think all of them. I think that, no, uh, there was, I think there was one exception that you noted that I really enjoyed this one. And that's okay. why I was actually excited to hear what you thought about this one. This is one of those exceptions. This was really, really good, partially because I didn't have to listen to a lot of stupid anti-gun crap, and also because you didn't just fisk, you dismantled this person and left them broken on the ground. And so I found it not only entertaining to listen to, but very, very useful. I mean... I'm I'm trying to commit to memory that bit about suicides because I get asked that a lot. Someone wants to talk to me as you know head of Pink Pistols or Blazing Sword. And it's like, well, what about the suicides? And it's like, okay, well, you know, we get rid of half, but we've still got half, and then of and then you know, single shot, we'd have to confiscate all of them and all of that. That was really really good. I'm going to make an effort to memorize that weird. This was one of your best fisks ever. Mwah. Well, thank you, Aaron. I, I'm blushing, but and that's and, and that was the whole point when I heard this. And actually, I will tell you right now, I actually had a little mishap where my actual my fisk folder actually got deleted. And uh, it wasn't it wasn't a huge loss because a lot of that stuff has been there for just ages. And it and I just I just instinctively do it when I see one and they go through and back when we were doing the gun blog variety cast and I wasn't editing and hosting that that show and I was just producing every week. You know, just the more the merrier, more stuff for me to cut up. And so if there was a dry week, I could I could dip back into the stuff. But there was stuff that was piling up from like, you know, our first like year of doing the show where, oh, this is interesting. I could do this, but it was never going to rise to the top. And and so uh, and of course, I don't do Fisks every week. But this one, it was one of those like, oh, no, I got to go back and grab that Brady campaign podcast because like the moment I heard this, I went, oh, this is perfect. Because I, I listen to their podcast. It's, they don't quite put it out every week. and they, But doing like double episodes, they just released two episodes yesterday. I, I don't really know exactly what, what they're trying to do here. But most of their podcasts are either super duper inane uh, or or are just so big and convoluted that I really couldn't cut them up for a fisk. And so I haven't bothered downloading the actual audio track. And this one though, it's beautiful because it's a podcast. It's 20 minutes long. And so that's a lot of fisking. Cause this was a, well, what was the final runtime on that one? Was it, was it, was it 12 minutes, 14 minutes? Uh, and so, and this is just the start of that podcast so it's orders of magnitude to debunk the crap that they just say but it's all very very basic anti-gun talking points they kind of go back to the basics and it's beautiful because again people keep asking me hey weird just do a fisk where you just talk about the basic stuff so we can have them all in one place and this is going to be the start of that project i'm going to be fisking some current stuff and at the same time, I will also give you really a good primer on the talking points you are going to hear from the, your average everyday anti-gunner, including the people that absolutely positively mean well. They just don't know anything about guns and they've just repeating what they've heard and what feels good in their heart. So I'm glad you loved it, Aaron, which is for both because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make people happy and give them some good information to work with, but also because I've got a bunch more <laughs> fisks scheduled for, for this. Uh, it's, it's a target rich environment. Mm -hmm. You're probably giving them more publicity than they get any other way. Well, the good news is that it's the Brady campaign. And so while people might not know they have a podcast, 
doesn't really help them in any way, shape or form. So, you know, for, for have, for having listeners, it's not like they take advertisement or do anything like that. They're just going to do that. And it's, there's clearly like a large number of staff behind it. So this is something that's costing whoever's paying the checks at, at Brady, whether it be Michael Bloomberg, as I suspect, or if it's still just the Brady campaign board of trustees, but everyone still knows the Brady campaign. They're still, we're the biggest name in, in anti-gun stuff. They're still the people that brought us the federal assault weapons ban and essentially brought about the, the, the tide turning on the gun control movement by them getting far too greedy. And so yeah, I, I'm I'm not concerned about giving them too much too too much publicity, especially if it means that I am going to arm some people with some mental weapons for the time when somebody around the water cooler or somebody at Thanksgiving dinner or something like that says, "Well, I don't think we need to be having these weapons of war," or as you said, "We need to do something about we need to take away the guns because we need to do something about suicide." You know, weird, uh, this podcast episode has had uh, a lot of topics and a lot of segments, and uh, I, I'm kind of fried. I, are we done? I I think we are done. So on that lovely note, I would like to thank each and every one of our listeners. That's right. I'm thanking you. You personally. That's right. No, I'm, 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 I'm thanking you. <laughs> But I'm also putting out a very special thanks to all our supporters on Patreon. Supporters on Patreon know we love you. And they know we love them because we give them stuff. <laughs> You're not just giving charity. You are are going to patreon.com slash the Calibers podcast. And if you once you sign up, you can get early releases of the podcast. But the big, the big stuff, the big juice is hilarious blooper reels. The ACP film tracks, again, go check out Lethal Weapon 3 and get yourself a copy of Lethal Weapon 3. Either rent it on Amazon or I don't know if it's still, I don't think it was ever streaming for free. But uh, get your hands on uh, Lethal, Lethal Weapon 3 and and, and, and the ACP uh, film track and, and listen to me fisk away. <laughs> it's pretty much a giant weird audio fisk over that movie. And of course we do uh, the ACP Mag Dump, which is our bonus show. Also, please remember to rate us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe to us on the platform of your choice, and share the show with your friends, both online and off. You can get more from me at my blog, which is weirdworld.com, and you can hear me weekly on Handgun Radio on the Firearms Radio Network. And you can get more from me at Linktree slash Aaron Paulette. That's linktree.e forward slash Aaron Paulette, all one word. <laughs> and thanks to Nate Spencer for our lovely music. Well, I avoided getting blown away, and he comes from a state that regularly blows the man down. Uh, you can kind of make your own joke here <laughs> about what's assorted, and so is our podcast. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>